This is the second part of our YouTube reading, finishing The Wild Robot Escapes, our kindergarten chapter book. We're going to start at chapter 70, The March Through the City. The main hall of Center City Station was enormous. Wide columns stretched up to an arched ceiling. A huge electronic screen flickered with train schedules. The whole place was bustling with humans and robots, and everyone seemed to know exactly where they were going. Everyone except Roz. There was our robot, standing still in the station while commuters hurried past her. She was trying to calculate her next move, and she had to think quickly. You see, a normal robot would never loiter there for so long. Roz needed to do something. Anything. And when a crew of Roz and robots marched past in single file, she could think of no better plan than to join the end of the line and pretend to be one of them. <gasps> More camouflage. She followed the crew through a set of doors, and suddenly they were outside. The city was a blur of activity. Automobiles hummed down the streets. Robots marched along the sidewalks. Humans talked and laughed and shouted. Buildings towered overhead, and above them, airships buzzed across the sky. Airships. For a moment, Roz was dreaming again about how easily she could get home with an airship. But reality came crashing back when a white triangular ship darted over. It was gone in an instant, disappearing behind the rooftops. But that was all it took for the robot's survival instincts to flare. Were the Ricos searching for Roz or going about some other business? Roz tried to focus on her immediate surroundings. She was still marching behind that crew of robots. With each step, she grew more nervous that they'd notice her tagging along. She wanted to break away, and as they started weaving and shuffling through a crowd of tourists, Roz slowed and stopped, and the robot crew continued on without her. Now Roz was on her own, but she still didn't know what to do or where to go. When in doubt, Brightbill had always guided her north, so our robot set off through the city in that direction. While marching northward, Roz passed beautiful boulevards and architecture and gardens and art. And yet she had to ignore it all. She had to act like a normal robot, and a normal robot would never wander the city admiring beautiful things. Oh, excuse me. I lost it. Wherever Roz looked, she saw normal robots concentrating on their tasks and on nothing else. They ran errands, delivered food, swept sidewalks, cleaned windows, fixed machines, built glorious structures, and did more jobs than you can possibly imagine. Ooh, there's some busy robots. Most walked on two legs, but some rolled on wheels or slid up and down the sides of buildings on tracks. The city was in a glittering was a glittering modern metropolis where humans lived in luxury all thanks to the tireless work of the robots. Roz was marching when the sunlight faded and the city lights brightened. She was marching when the humans went in for the night and the robots continued to work. She was marching when the sun came up and the humans filtered out of their buildings. A new day began in the city and there was Roz marching north, blending in, anxiously hoping her son would appear. Here's a picture of the city with its tall buildings. Is the city a very busy place or a very calm place? It's very busy. And what does Roz have to do in order to blend in here? She has to pretend she's very busy too, even when she doesn't really know what to be busy with. Chapter 71, The Observations Sunlight sparkled off the skyline. New buildings were constructed. Old buildings were taken down. Cargo ships docked in the harbor. Delivery trucks unloaded crates. Bright signs flickered with advertisements. Robots worked behind the scenes. Children played in parks. 
Adults ate and drank at outdoor cafes. The city pulsed with energy. A wild robot observed it all. Chapter 72, The Police. A pair of police robots stood on the sidewalk while foot traffic glided past them. Their heads swiveled back and forth as they scanned the crowd with their glowing eyes. The police looked menacing, but they sounded friendly. Whenever a human walked by, they'd say, have a nice day, in a perky voice. There were lots of humans walking by, so the police kept repeating their words. Have a nice day, have a nice day, have a nice day. Our robot was not having a nice day. She was alone in the city. She was worried about her son and she wanted nothing to do with the police, but she couldn't avoid them. If she turned suddenly, she might draw their attention. So she kept her eyes forward and calmly marched along with the other robots on the street. Roz may have looked calm on the outside, but on the inside, her thoughts were scrambled. Were the police dangerous? Did they work with the Recos? Was she about to be caught? It seemed as if the police were watching Roz. Their eyes lingered on her for a second, two seconds, three seconds, and then they continued scanning the crowd. Our robot felt something like relief when she made it past without incident. She went on her way, just another robot on the street, and those perky voices gradually faded behind her. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Chapter 73. The Pigeons. In the very heart of the city was a great swath of greenery, the old park. It had rolling lawns and flower gardens and dense wooded areas. It had lakes and ponds and fountains. It had playgrounds and benches and miles of cobblestone pathways. It also had pigeons. Thousands and thousands of pigeons. The city pigeons witnessed things you wouldn't believe. Nothing shocked them. They certainly weren't shocked by robots. So when Roz marched into the middle of the park, the pigeons there weren't troubled in the least. She approached a flock that was about a hundred birds strong, all cooing and strutting across the cobblestones as if they owned the place. Hoo, hoo. But as Ross stomped closer and closer, the pigeon scuttled out of the way to let her pass by. However, Roz didn't pass by. She stopped and glanced around, and when she saw that she was all alone with the pigeons, she started speaking to them in the language of the animals. Hello, pigeons. My name is Roz. The pigeons cocked their heads, which meant, is this robot actually speaking to us? Yes, I am actually speaking to you, continued Roz. I am searching for my son. He is a goose named Brightbill. Have you seen him? For the first time in a long time, the pigeons were shocked. Several of them fluttered away from the talking robot, but most were too curious to leave. One pigeon was so curious that she strutted off from the flock and right up to the robot. Let me get this straight, said the curious pigeon. Your name's Roz, and you've got a son named Brightbill, who's a goose? That is correct. I can't believe it. The pigeon flapped her wings and turned to the others. You guys, this is Roz from Greybeak Stories, remember? The flock began cooing excitedly. Coo, 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 coo. You have heard of Greybeak, said Roz. Everyone's heard of Greybeak, said the pigeon. A while back, she started telling stories about a goose whose mother was some kind of wild robot. We all thought she was joking, but I guess not. She was not joking, said Roz, but I have lost my son and I don't know how to find him. Perhaps Grapey could help. Do you know where she is? Here's a picture of one of the pigeons.
Oh, I hate to tell you this, Roz, but Great Beak is dead. The birds all lowered their heads. You know, life ain't easy for us pigeons. We only live a few years out here, if we're lucky. But we're especially sad that we lost Gray Beak. She was one of the best. The others cooed in agreement. Coo, coo. I'm sorry for your loss, said Roz. I wish I had gotten to meet Graybeak. My son was very fond of her. The pigeon gazed up at the robot with a steely look in her eye. Any friend of Graybeak is a friend of ours. If Brightville is lost, we're gonna find him. She turned to the others. You heard me, flock, hit the skies. And tell every pigeon you see to start searching for a goose named Brightville. At those words, the flock of 100 pigeons erupted into flight. Only the robot and the one curious pigeon remained. By the way, they call me Strutter, said the pigeon, fluffing out her chest feathers. It's very nice to meet you, Strutter, said uh, the robot. Thank you for searching for Brightville. What can I do to help? You can help by staying put. I want you in this park when we return with your son. Don't hide or wander off and make us go searching for you, too. Oh, and another thing, Strutter added. Stay away from the park ranger robot. He spends most of his time taking care of the grounds, but he's always on the lookout for troublemakers. The pigeon gave a quick salute to the robot. Then she joined in the search for Brightville. Wow, so we learned something about Graybeak. We learned that Graybeak is no longer with us, but the flock of pigeons is ready to help Roz. That's really good. And Roz just needs to stay hidden in the park. Wonder how she'll do that. Let's find out. Chapter 74, The Sky. Hours passed and the sun set in the west. More hours passed and the eastern sky began to glow. Ross spent that whole night in the park, waiting for Strutter to return with Brightbill, but there was no sign of them. In fact, there weren't any birds in the park at all. Roz couldn't let those thoughts distract her. She needed to stay alert. The park ranger robot had seen her once or twice already, and now she heard his footsteps wherever she went. Was the park ranger following Roz? Had he noticed our robot's unit number? Would he report her to the Recos? Ross, Roz took a pathway into the woods, trying to escape the ranger's view. And that's when she heard familiar voices calling from the sky. Where are you, Ma? said Brightville. Come on out, Roz, said Strutter. Roz turned toward the voices, but only saw leaves and branches. Brightville and Strutter were flying somewhere above the woods. She wanted to call back to them, but the park ranger was still trailing her. Instead, she followed the sounds of the voices as they glided over the rooftops, over the treetops, excuse me. But then there came a new sound, a buzzing sound. It grew louder and closer. Air started blasting down from the sky, and when Roz looked up, she saw a white triangular airship floating above her. My friends at home, what does a white triangular airship mean? That's the Reco's ship. Seems like they may have found her. <sighs> Let's find out what happens next. Chapter 75, The Reco's. Three robots zipped down from the airship on cables. The ground shook as their heavy feet slammed against the cobblestones. Then they stood side by side, forming a wall with their eyes locked on Roz. They were Reco 4, Reco 5, and Reco 6. Hello, Rosam Unit 7134. We are the Recos. Please come with us. The robotic voice belonged to Reco 4. 
He and his partners waited for their target to come forward, but Roz didn't move. She knew how dangerous the Recos could be, and so did her son. From somewhere in the sky, Brightbill's frightened voice cried out, Run, Mama, run! So Roz ran. Here's a picture of the Recos coming down from their airship. Three of them. Reco four, Reco five, and Reco six. She dashed up the pathway and leapt into the woods. Without crunching a weed, without rustling a leaf, the robot vanished into the thick foliage. The Recos weren't concerned. They had other ways of tracking her, or so they thought. Their blocky heads swiveled from side to side, scanning the woods for Roz's electronic signal. They scanned and scanned and scanned, but they found no trace of their target. I'm gonna stop there for this section. We'll have just one or two more videos to finish up the end of this story. So you can keep going if you want to, or right now is a great time to take a break too.